Good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for coming tonight. Welcome to the Berkeley Center for New Media's Art, Technology, and Culture Colloquium. My name is Abigail DeKosnick, and I'm the director of the Berkeley Center for New Media, which we call BCNM. Uh, BCNM is an interdisciplinary research center that studies and shapes media transition and emergence from diverse perspectives. Through critical thinking and making, we cultivate technological fairness and equity in our classrooms, in our communities, communities and on the internet. Our Art Technology and Culture Colloquium, founded in 1997 by Ken Goldberg, is an internationally respected forum for creative ideas. Free and open to the public, it presents leading artists, writers, and critical thinkers who question assumptions and push boundaries at the forefront of multiple intersecting fields. It's always a pleasure to introduce ATC events, but a special one to introduce a Berkeley alumna. Margaret, we're very pleased to host BCNM and Ethnic Studies alum Margaret Ree with generous co-sponsorship from the Department of Comparative Literature and the Department of Ethnic Studies. In collaboration with the Arts and Design Mondays, a, regularly, a regular weekly series organized and sponsored by UC Berkeley's Art Plus Design Initiative. The series is co-curated by BCNM's Art Technology and Culture Colloquium, the Department of Art Practice, the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, the Digital Humanities at Berkeley, the Arts Research Center, the Graduate School of Journalism, and the Richmond Arts and Culture Commission. I'd like now to invite my wonderful colleague, Professor Ken Goldberg, to come up and introduce Margaret. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Big round of applause for Gail, who's Take it over as our director and doing a fantastic job there. I also want to thank Shannon for everything that she's been doing for this series, Eric Paulos for being here from, from the beginning for some 20 some years, and also our, our wonderful staff. We have Lara Wolf, Sophia Hussein, and Lara McAfee who work behind the scenes to help coordinate these, these lectures, and I really appreciate it. It's super fun to work with them. I also want to mention that we have, in addition to tonight, coming up on April 13th, will be the last speaker in this series um, on the topic of robo-exoticism. He's an artist from New Zealand who creates these beautiful um, algorithmically generated images. That's on April 13th. And then three days later, April 16th, we have the curator, a pair of curators, Christian Paul from uh, New York at the Whitney and uh, New School. And she'll be joined by Claudia Schmuckley, who is at the De Young, who just has a new show that opened this week, last week, uh, called The Uncanny Valley, about AI in the age of humanity, or something like that. Um, but it's a, it's a great show if you want to see it. <laughs> now, one of the things I, I, I want to just say about where we are in our cultural moment, there's a huge amount of, of turmoil going on, as you all know. And we are uh, we're in the middle of a presidential election. Uh, they is, is one of the hugest factors in my mind that we're facing is, uh, is, is widespread, rampant xenophobia. And it's, 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 it's own, in people considering others who are in all different forms, others in terms of race, culture, class, and in, in, in addition to, uh, to, to, to foreign cultures. And that's why I really think it's so interesting for us to look at this topic this year of what we're calling robo-exoticism, which is to apply the, the framework of exoticism to the category of technology and specifically robots and AI because it seems to operate very analogously. So uh, we're very delighted to introduce our speaker tonight who really exemplifies this. She taught me quite a bit, actually, about this intersection. And her, her, when she was here, as, uh, as Gail mentioned, she's a, an alum, go Bears. She's got her PhD here from Berkeley in, um, in Ethnic Studies and also has a, was an undergraduate at USC in creative writing. So she's combined these two things in her career. She is a poet, a scholar, an activist, and a new media artist. She works at this intersection of technology and art, feminism, career studies, and she has produced a great body of, of writing and work. She has been um, the author of a very important collection of poems called Love Robot that was won three big um, awards, the uh, 2017 Best Book of Poetry Award from the Entropy Magazine, the 2018 Elgin Award by the Science Fiction Poetry Association, and the 2019 Best Book Award in Poetry by the Asian American Studies Association. So she's been producing 
we're producing poems and we, we had some really great interactions when she was here at Berkeley. And then she's gone on to, she's now working on a, a monograph um, that will be her, her first book. It's How We Became Human, Race, Robots, and the Asian American Body. She is, she's published widely in a number of, um, uh, of, of venues. She's taught at UCLA, University of Oregon, and Harvard, where she was a college fellow at the Digital Practice and, and is still a fellow at the Meta Lab. She has won awards for her art and interventions, one of which was the HIV AIDS digital storytelling, digital storytelling project at the San Francisco jail, which won the Chancellor's Award for uh, public service from, the, from here at UC Berkeley. She's won the Yamashita Prize and for the Young Activists at the Center for Social Change. And she has, oh wait, there's three pages of, of notes on her. She has, uh, she has a new media project, the Kimchi Project, that is, or, or sorry, this is a new media project called the Kimchi Poetry Machine that was exhibited at the Electronic Literature Collection. And she is also working on a full-length poetry collection called I Offer You My Body Instead, inspired by the ethnic studies and education strikes at Berkeley. And she is... Is she has been writing a number of essays, including one on the the film Parasite, which, as as you know, this is uh, Bong Joon Ho's riveting film on class or class inequality that was the first foreign language film to win the Academy Award. So she has an essay on on that, which I don't know if she'll touch on tonight, but it's very very interesting take on it. And she is now a professor at. Um, at SUNY Buffalo in the Department of Media Studies, and she co-leads what she calls the, uh, the, the Paula Light Studios, Creative Space for Poetry Participation and Pedagogy Through Technology. Please welcome Margaret Reed. I want to thank um, Ken so much for um, his inv invitation here and that generous introduction, and to Gail for introducing, introducing um, the series. It's such an honor to be here, so thank you both so much. Um, I also want to thank the BCNM um, staff with Laura, Sophia, and Caitlin for their support um, in my visit here. So I'm pleased to introduce um, and share some ideas um, around race and the robot. Um, as Ken mentioned um, in my talk, In Search for My Robot, Emergent Technologies, Racialized Gender, and Creativity. And it's great to be back. So, all right. I've been searching. And in my search, I find my robot within and in the gaps between the deep legacy of film and media studies and new media studies, racial theory, feminist science and technology theorizing, queer theory, and the fe feminist cyborg. This work includes delving into cuts and soldering across the various parts. In this presentation, I trace the representational processes of making and unmaking human and machine demarcations within the US empire. More specifically, I highlight key instances when Asian American racialization is co-constitutive with the machine and how the robot in particular is a primary locus of racialization for Asian Americans, but where to find her? She is typing, her hands are on a keyboard. A computer board, DPI switches and wires runs down and covers her chest. A cyborg with a human face. Her long black hair is covered. A tiger headdress rests atop her body. The skeleton of the animal's limbs visible and highlighted. I turn to this particular painting not only because it is the cover illustration for theorist Donna Haraway's Simeon Cyborgs and Women, and one of the most iconic illustrations of the cyborg, but because it also represents how race, gender, and cybernetic formations imbricate 
As one observes, the cyborg is an Asian American woman. Drawn directly from Haraway's iconic essay, The Cyborg Manifesto, painter Lynn Randolph recounts, quote, Haraway's depiction of Asian women with nimble fingers working in enterprise zones for very little remuneration stuck in my head. Moreover, one of Randolph's late husband's sociology students, a young Chinese woman, Grace Lee, was her model for the painting. While Haraway's article is not centrally about Asian Americans, the painting offers how closely tied the image of the cyborg is with the Asian body, because while Asianness is denoted by phenotypical characteristics, black hair, dark eyes, and tan skin, I demonstrate that the DPI switches and cyborgian parts of her body also denotes a racialized gender. So I end here with the question, when does human end and cyborg begin, and where do we locate Asian American within the boundaries of the machine? While the human and animal distinction has been central to Euro-American modernity's conceptualization of the human, a third term, less analyzed, has also played a central role, the machine. As a mechanism, race is inherently imbricated in the shifting demarcations between human, animal, and machine. And although the animal functioned to justify slavery and objecthood for indigenous and black people, the machine has largely been utilized in the service of Asian racialization and subjugation. So my talk um, draws from my uh, scholarly book project, How We Became Human, Race, Robots, and the Asian American Body, which undertakes a historical and theoretical approach to the particular version of modernism where humanity can, not, can be denied not only through opposition of the animal-human binary, but also the machine-human binary. This machine story, as Randolph Cyborg painting offers, includes how diasporic East Asian Americans in particular have been dialectically rendered as machines within the human and machine di um, dichotomy. However, this racialization as Randolph's feminist cyborg, um, the painter for Donna Haraway's um, cover image, also illustrates, can be disrupted and recalibrated by visual art, digital, and other emergent ex um, experimental new media. To further introduce these core arguments and historical grounding, I will introduce another example where Asians have been racialized as robot. In March 2014, a special issue of The Economist, Rise of the Robots, published a report on robots entitled Immigrants from the Future. The report itself was nothing new. Special issues on robots have been published before. For example, um, Time Magazine released a special issue in 2010. 13 that was identically entitled Rise of the Robots, and both publications illuminate the gr ever-growing fascination with and trepidation about the role of artificial beings in society. Yet the title of The Economist special report is particularly interesting, um, and so this is the web version of the first cover image that we just saw. Um, and so while race is not mentioned, the trope of the robot and immigration is evoked through mention of Russian-born American science fiction writer Isaac Asimov's, quote, his robot stories and those of his successors were immigrant stories, except that the robots were immigrant not from abroad, but from the future, unquote. So as described by The Economist, Awesomest stories were immigrant stories that explored issues of difference. Um, and I also want to point out that this image is of um, Astro Boy, the Japanese animation. And here are some cover images of Awesomest's work. So while immigrants were not central characters in Osimus' books, robots were, and they were largely featured as second-class laborers bearing an uncanny resemblance to the characterization of Asian Americans. As Jasnia Rykop writes in Robots, Fact, Fiction, and Predilection, 
Indeed, quote, in literature, the robot has been a metaphor for a second-class citizen because the robot is made from metal, because it has been manufactured rather than grown, because it thinks with transistors rather than photoplasm, it is almost always treated with condescension, even though it may demonstrate superhuman abilities, loyalty, and talents, unquote. So this characterization of robots from The Economist and other outlets of popular culture um, about robots bears an uncanny resemblance to the model minority stereotype of Asian Americans. And this stereotype is largely um, something that characterizes Asian Americans as assimilatory, superhuman, emotionless, non-creative, um, laborers, immigrants, and um, superb at math. Um, and so this model minority stereotype also connects to gendered essentialisms, such as the hypersexuality of Asian femininity and the emasculation of Asian American masculinity. And further investigation of the robot can also help us untie these denigrating stereotypes. Like Asian Americans, the Economist report focuses on how the number of robots will increase as well as their capabilities, prompting further parallel of the orientalized threat of immigrants from abroad. The automaton, as historian Min Su Kong has argued, is important because of the critical role it played as a conceptual tool in which Western culture has pondered the very nature and boundaries of humanity. In the same way, the racial distinction of Asian Americans confronts the ideological understandings of the human. And so while my research demonstrates Asian Americans have been racialized as robots within modernity's distinction between humans and machines, I also found that robots, technology, and artificial intelligence has always also been imbued with difference. Um, and so as mentioned, my monograph, How We Became Human, is a historical and theoretical study in the context of the United States. And in this project, I relate major instances of where the robot is racialized and the Asian American body is mechanized. And so in order to explain these intersections of race and technology, um, I look at three different time periods. I look at the 19th century and um, and um, the industrial period, as well as the 1960s, and then the contemporary moment. Um, and in doing so, I examine the Asian American body and show how industrialization and technological development and race have intersected in their development and informed one another to shape what I call the Asian and as automaton discourse, the racialization of Asian American as machine. And so for the sake of time today, I will actually only talk about um, the research and the chapters on the 19th um, century um, briefly, um, and a majority of the talk on Nam Jun Pak, who is also understood as one of the first video artists and um, roboticist um, who um, did really exciting um, robotic art and the contemporary moment. And so in addition to my monograph, my interest in new media and media studies includes my work in new media art. And so I will also discuss um, these chapters as well as a discussion of creative projects um, very much in line of um, the way um, BCNM graduate training happens in terms of not only um, engaging with theory, but also with creative practice. And that's something um, that's um, incredibly important in terms of thinking about these in intersections. Um, and so um, along with that, I, um, I will you know, present this archive of diverse emergent and experimental media. And um, to illustrate my concept of the Asian and as automaton, um, that our understanding of the automaton, while it's largely without personhood, that in fact it's historically and presently and deeply racialized and gendered. And so this really connects with um, Ken's um, concept of robo-exoticism, um, and I will delve really more directly into, into xenophobia and Asian American racialization. Um, and so, so let's turn to the 19th century. Um, in 1826, a large crowd of New Yorkers at the Nat 
a national hotel experienced a new kind of mechanization with the New York debut of the automaton chess player. Exhibited by German showman Johann Matzel and known as, quote, the Turk, the automaton chess player was a chess playing machine that fascinated American viewers in antebellum U.S. with its miraculous ability to play against and beat human players. A Turkish magician dressed in um, Arabic attire, the automaton chess player was a life-size model of a head and torso that resided on top of a cabinet displaying a chessboard. And later it is discovered that the automaton Turk was a hoax, but the performance of the Turk that played chess with human accuracy and acunum fooled all audiences. During this particular time of technological transformation, um, we can look at um, developments in terms of steam power, electricity, automobiles. Um, the automaton Turk signal, signaled to individuals at the event as a gesture into a future that seemed uncertain. While the automaton is largely understood without personhood, the automaton Turk is one primary example of how the history of the automaton has, in fact, been deeply racialized and particularly orientalized. And we can also see um, how the Turk itself has connections to our contemporary moment. Um, and this is a, you know, image of the Amazon Turk, if, in case folks have accessed that service. And so while um, the automaton Turk um, came to the U.S., um, the Oriental others, quote unquote, during this period were actually not Turkish, but they were newly arriving Chinese immigrant laborers. The Chinese laborers' presence provoked racial and technical anxieties within the industrializing United States. And so I introduced the Turk not to provide a comparison between the Turk or the Chinese, but to illustrate how the history of the robot has always always been imbued within the history of difference. So as the United States was ushered into modernity through emerging industrial technologies of this period, um, and I mentioned steam um, and electricity and the automobile, but we can also look at um, communications technologies such as the telegraph and the typewriter and the cinema, um, which have all helped shape and and transformed the United States from a largely agrarian society into a world power. Like the machines that were similarly changing labor structures, the Chinese provoked debates among industrialists who relied on anti-Chinese rhetoric to make the case for hiring Chinese laborers to work these machines that were um, entering the factories. The Asian and as automaton discourse racialized the Chinese as machine, which justified not only the perception of their difference from black labor during this period, but also both their difference from whites and their similarity to machines in the political movement of Chinese exclusion. The way that Chinese laborers were characterized as automaton demonstrates that their de denigration worked to reestablish the boundaries between human and machine, white and Chinese. During the antebellum period, changes in mechanization and the labor market infused the human and machine analytic with racial connotations in particular for Chinese bodies. Um, and so um, for the purposes of this talk, I'll just show one image among an archive of images that proliferated during this period. So in response to these changing developments, the Asian and as automaton discourse was depicted through a myriad of visual media, editorial cartoons um, in national publications such as Harper's, um, as well as um, minstrel shows and novels. And I will share one example what Should We Do With Our Boys, an editorial cartoon designed by George Frederick Keller in 1882 for the California publication The Wasp. So this image depicts a multi-armed Chinese laborer frantically working um, and managing several tasks, juxtaposed with the scene of white men who are out of work, and you can see them um, to your right. And depicted as non-human, the Chinese resembles a machine-like entity that can do multiple tasks. Um, 
Behind the Chinese labor um, is a sewing machine and iron tendered by the Chinese laborers, many hands, while the labor rapidly works in a wide variety of industries. From hammering, painting, and sawing, and laundering, and sewing, the Chinese labor here is not only just machine-like, but in some ways a machine, but almost more than a machine. Moreover, the Chinese automaton is illustrated as squinting a near sightless entity that shows no expression or emotion as he works. His cue um, is swinging, a further indication of an inhuman feminine and foreign status. And outside, these young white laborers have been turned away from the factories and left without work. Dressed elegantly with hats and gathered in a crowd, the young white men appear to be loitering with their fate left to the railroad or prison in the distance. The vision, um, this visual illustrates that the multi-armed machine-like Chinese labor were taking white labor's positions and like the caption, the United States must ask, quote, what shall we do with our boys? And so collectively, these representations that proliferated during this period demonstrate how Chinese racial characteristics were mechanized. So in these images, the Chinese were depicted as, quote, cheap labor and inhuman, and rather than being seen as human, they were simultaneously denigrated and ironically praised as automaton. So as the term robot was first coined and introduced to the U.S. by Czech playwright Carl Caprick's play R.U.R. Rossum's Universal Robots in 1920, the play describes a factory that makes artificial people called robots who later create a robot rebellion. So indeed, the similarities between the robot as initially conceived and the history of the Chinese labor may seem uncanny. Anti-Chinese organizing and the labor movement were intertwined as the working class fought the emerging technologies of industry that displaced their work and race to solidify the human and machine divide. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 is one example of the success of the emerged and then mature technology, the racialization of Chinese as automaton who were then you know pulled into a racial category that was mechanized um, as well as um, their role in terms of being eco economically exploited and they were imbued with stereotypes used to justify policies ex that excluded Asian Americans for over 61 years. Now I wanted to turn very briefly to a contemporary example of the Asian end as automaton discourse, um, and which this discourse has um, its very early genealogies, but certainly we can trace it to the present day. And so mapping from this initial encounter, um, we can also see this manifesting in contemporary cinema as well as television. And so, for example, in a later um, chapter of my book, I provide a close reading of the 2015 film Ex Machina, directed by Alex Garland, to address the Ch Asian presence in fembot cinema. While the representation of fembots and gender have been discussed within feminist critiques of cinema, the racial dimensions of these films have not been adequately analyzed. As a bridge between female and robot, the fembot was a term first coined in the 1976 television show, The Bionic Woman. Since then, the fembot has appeared across genres of films with a science fictional bent, such as Blade Runner, Robot Stories, Her, and even Austin Powers. With the rise of science fictional films about AI and the mechanization of gender and race in cinematic form cannot be ignored. So while these themes are run through the films include labor, class division, and romance, another similarity that these films share is the presence of Asian background and bodies. Through a cinematic tri triangulation, robot characters um, such as Ava in the film Ex Machina are able to elicit empathy and connection as belief is suspended and racialize others um, such as Kyoko that we can see here in this still um, are utilized to uphold this hierarchy of human and machine. And more specifically, through cinematic elements such as montage and mise-en-scene, Asian characters or presence are triangulated with fembots and white men in Ex Machina. 
This triangulation, while seemingly, simmer, um, seemingly simplistic, is maintained throughout the trajectory of the film in which Asian or minority characters quote-unquote become robots in cinematic depictions and white robots in the film become um, human. For the purposes of this talk, as mentioned, I just um, kind of briefly touch on this film, but I'm also happy um, to take questions or um, discuss the film further in the Q&A. So um, in this next part, I wanted to introduce a quote by um, Nam Jun Pak as we turn to the 1960s. Quote, the real implied issue in art and technology is not to make another scientific toy, but how to humanize the technology and the electronic medium, which is progressing rapidly, too rapidly, unquote. So since the 19th century, the particular figure of the automaton has haunted the representation of Asians um, in the Americas, such as the depiction of ex machina, functioning as a primary locus of racialization. However, artists and em emergent um, technologies have utilized the very figure of the robot to resist. So if the antebellum period was a time of Asian identification with the machine, the 1960s offered new ways of utilizing the robot in a way of dewiring by way of emergent media. So in particular, I turn us to the robotic and video work of artist Nam Jun Pak as a primary figure who offers um, insights on utilizing the robot as a means of racial resistance. In the course of a 40-year career, artist Nam Jun Pak cemented his position as an innovator with his groundbreaking um, 1967 artistic utilization of the Sony Portapak. Widely recognized as the first video artist, Pak has been an innovator of experimental and emergent media, as he's um, largely understood as an uh, electronic pioneer. For example, works such as TV Buddha, um, Global Groove, and Electronic Superhighway, um, this is my favorite piece, um, but demonstrate his innovation in, in um, technology and emergent media. The artist's visionary work influenced a new generation of artists such as um, Bill Viola and others who used video in its aesthetic potential. Pak foresaw the aesthetic potential of video as well as other emerging technologies such as robotics. Moreover, his commitment to cybernetic interaction breaks the passivity of the audience and is the foundation of his mission to humanize the technology. While his work in robotic art is less commonly analyzed, it sheds significant light on his position not only as a pioneering artist of new media, but also in discussions concerning his racialized gender and ethnic identity. So Pac's technological medium included objects, television, robots, and synthesizers, which do not commonly or neatly fit into what we understand as Asian American art, a term that is still centered on um, questioning its very identity. In the context of racialization in the US, where Asian Americans have been historically racialized as robot, Pac's aesthetic work um, and use of machines however, prompts questions concerning strategies of resistance. Pak did not overtly emerge, um, engage with race and racism in his oeuvre. However, through my research at the Smithsonian Art Museum, um, I found that race actually did inform his uh, work and his writing. So with Robot Opera and K456, the robot that we see here, the artist deployed a strategy of what I call racial recalibration, a racial formation that occurs through aesthetic tinkering, hacking, and recreating with emergent technologies that rewires racial knowledge of Asian Americans as robot. Embracing the robot and other emergent media, he both revealed the contours of racial formation and resisted the historical racialization of Asians and Asian Americans as robotic in the 19th century popular automaton discourse. And in his work, Pa claims the robot, the very figure of Asian racial denigration, problematizing the boundaries of human and machine, subject and object, and thereby humanizing Asian Americans, including himself. 
Pak's stated concern with art and technology was not only how to humanize the technology, and yet, um, you know, he he did this in terms of also thinking about um, multiple uh, disciplines and genres of art, including performance art. And his collaborations, especially with um, performance artists and musician Charlotte Mormon and the performance TV Bra for Living Sculpture, were examples of ways in which the artists humanized the technology. In 1969, Mormon was one of the queens of the New York avant-garde, and she sat naked on stage with a large cello held between her shapely legs and two small television sets cradling her breasts. Pac interrupted the static nature of the television with a cybernetic interaction with the human body. Connected to Mormon's cello were wires transmitting live images to the television bra, which would change according to the music produced by Mormon's hands and the wooden cello bow. The feedback loop between cello, transistor, and body really um, identified the cybernetic loop. At the time that Pac arrived to the U.S., um, his collaboration with cellist and um, artist Mormon was a very unlikely pairing and actually incredibly groundbreaking in its transgression of racial boundaries. So while early Ch uh, Korean immigration to U North America occurred at the beginning of the 20th century, exclusionary quotas such as the 1917 um, U.S. Um, Asiatic Barred Zone Act as well as the U.S. Immigration Act of 1924, actually halted Korean immigration. And it was only until 1965 when the um, Immigration and Nationality Act was passed. And from there, um, between um, uh, the 1882, um, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which um, was discussed earlier, and, the 1950, and 1954, virtually all Asian immigrants were excluded from citizenship in the U.S., and so while a handful of Asian artists participated in the avant-garde and in New York and the Fluxus movement, few were Korean. And broadly speaking, Pac had arrived in the U.S. against the backdrop of an entrenched historical and ideological understanding of Asian Americans as excluded from the state and largely rendered as legislatively non-citizen and ideological, ideologically inhuman. Yet, at the peak of the 1960s, the artists would witness a period of rapid technological uh, transformation and theoretical advancements in terms of civil rights, um, media theory, the space race, the advent of television, and other technologies that informed his work. And so if we return to Mormon and actually her early recollection of meeting Pak, it actually sheds light on this um, on the ways that in which Korean American immigrants at this time and um, were characterized in, in the 1960s. So in a 1980 interview, Mormon recounts the first time she met and she heard of Pac from German composer Karl Stockhausen when he was visiting New York City in 1964 with her desire to reenact his theater piece, The Originale. Stockhausen protested the idea of re-performing the work in New York since he had created the specific piece um, for specific artists in Germany. Mormon responded by naming several New York City artists, such as the poet Allen Ginsberg and director Alan Capro, who could perform these roles, to which Stockhausen replied, quote, you have to have Pac, unquote. Mormon recalled her puzzlement, quote, and I said, what's a Pac? And it turns out it's a human being, Namjoon Pak, end quote. So her failure to recognize Pak's last name shows how unfamiliar Korean last names were at this period. Yet her response also ironically points to the ideological struggle of Asian diasporic subjects like Pak to be recognized as human. Although Mormon had not recognized Pak's name referred to a human being, no less an art artist, Sakhasin stated that the originale could only be performed on the provision that Pak be invited from Germany to the U.S. because, quote, no one else can play Pak, unquote. 
Mormon recounts that Pac serendipitously arrives in New York on the very same day, as the story goes, and suggests an artistic partnership. I want to make peace for you. We become partners. And I'm looking at him, wondering why I would need him as a partner. I can't believe that I'm sitting here talking to this, this oriental man about these things. And um, there's something about him, but he was so serious and so strong that I listened. And we became partners, and everything in the world has happened to us as a result. When recounting the meeting, Mormon affectionately imitates Pac's accented English with the rolling of the R's. However, it doesn't serve simply to demarcate the racial or ethnic difference between Pac and Mormon. Her astonishment at, quote, sitting here talking to this, this oriental man, unquote, about such things such as striptease, playing the cello, and taking off her clothes, reflects the racial, gender, and sexual hierarchies of America in the 1960s. And so the word oriental is a problematic term characterizing human beings as objects, and the larger Asian American movement has, um, was focused on dismantling this term through um, pan-ethnicity and taking up the um, uh, identification as Asian American. And so Mormon is recognized for her visionary um, leadership of the New York avant-garde and her artistic partnership with Pac. And although her account of Pac is gentle, it's comical, and it's tender, this very early recollection when she um, hadn't met him yet and then you know, met him for the first time reflects a larger ra racialization um, and um, invokes race-inflected power relations. Um, and so, along with this, Pac himself recounts moments of being dehumanized by way of his last name in other writings, um, and not by Mormon, but um, in different kinds of cultural spaces. How did the artist transform from a Pac to an artist who was seriously and um, persuasively um, able to convince um, Mormon for collaboration? And I argue he was not only persuasive in conversation, but also visually and conceptually through what I call racial recalibration. So new media artist and roboticist Ken Goldberg argues in the formative book, The Robot in the Garden, that, quote, each new invention for communication or measurement forces us to recalibrate our definition of knowledge, unquote. For Goldberg, new inventions do not operate in a void. Instead, new inventions, such as the television, the video camera, and the computer, force us to rethink, re-question, and recalibrate our definitions of knowledge. Um, and this work, The Robot in the Garden, was incredibly informative for um, my thinking about the robot um, and, and the intersection of art and society. And so while ro uh, um, while the book and Goldberg does not focus specifically on race, I draw on his idea of recalibration to rethink how the force of new inventions also affects racial knowledge. So building upon an in-conversation with racial formation theory, I propose that racial recalibration is a particular form of racial formation as it articulates how race is particularly transformed by way of technological trans invention. So using technology as a tool of aesthetic and political intervention in the context of Asian and Asian American media art, Pac's deployment of racial recalibration puts pressure on the human and machine binary by altering and deconstructing binary logic, embracing creativity, and transforming meanings of race and um, becoming human. So racial recalibration is an aesthetic strategy that explicitly takes on the figure of racial denigration for Asian Americans, the robot. In particular, Pac's writing and robotic art of the 1960s, such as K456 and Robot Opera, illuminates how Pac engaged in racial recalibration. It is to Pac's robots to, um, to which we shall now turn to discuss how Asians become human. So in 1964, Pox K456, a 20-channel radio-controlled anthropomorphic robot and the first quote-unquote artist robot, 
premiered at the Festival of the Avant-Garde in New York City, Circuits Notwithstanding, K456, played audio speeches by John F. Kennedy, defecated beans from its backside, and interacted with people in the gallery and on the street, marking a new precedent in robotic art that has since matured into an innovative art form. Created by Pac in collaboration with Japanese roboticist Shuyu Abe, K456 was Pac's first media art um, shown in the U.S. and was his first performance with um, Charlotte Marmont entitled Robot Opera. Pac wrote specifically about the role of race in the robot opera Ephemera, which includes a brochure created for the avant-garde festival. Written with a sharpie and typed with a typewriter, the prose embodies avant-garde aesthetics through its unconventionality. The brochure features a photograph of K456, along with photograph newspaper clippings and manufactured clippings by Pock that blur the line between reality and fiction. The clippings are typed and positioned in a disorderly fashion. Some are horizontal, some are vertical, as you can see, and altogether, it's a very um, scattered type of brochure. Through the clippings dis or disordering of linearity, the brochure parallels the hybridization and transgressions of dichotomies in robotic art. Importantly, and for the purposes of this discussion, the robot opera Ephemera also includes a 1965 poem titled Penze, A Thought, that specifically points to Asia, minority status, and binaries. And in it, Pog writes, quote, please don't idealize the Asia, but please don't despise the Asia. The latter leads to imperialism, the former camouflages the imperialism. Pog's stanza alludes to the political context of war and racial transnational differences undergirding and internally uh, fragmenting imperial powers, the US and Korea, in conflict. Pog was born in colonial Korea to a wealthy merchant family who moved to Hong Kong, then to Japan in 1949. Pak, however, resisted colonial allegiance, and he was influenced above all by Marx and, and actively aligned himself with North Korea. So in 1956, he migrated to Germany for further schooling and to nurture its interests in composition and become a well-regarded emerging experimental composer and performance artist known for his bombastic and cutting-edge work. Moreover, it was Pac's minority status as an Asian, um, as Asian that shaped his tactical utilization of technology, as suggested by his reference to American poet Allen Ginsberg, who asked why Pac focuses on technology as his art artistic medium. Pac responded, I answer to Allen Ginsberg, quote, perhaps my minority complex as an Asian or Korean drives me to compose a very complicated cybernetic arts, end quote. Coming from an artist born in an era of Korean colonial um, imperial relations in the U.S. and Japan, his insights refers to the imperialization of Asia, noting explicitly the cybernetic arts, as a strategy of resistance to the minority complex as an Asian or Korean. This reference to imperialism refers to the connection between new media technologies and war, suggesting Pak's use of technology and art not only as a tool, but also as a form and a critique of empire deeply attuned to imperialism through technological innovations. And so a lot of this um, material and the ephemera that I found um, in the archive um, differs very drastically from Pac's um, larger body of work. And so as we can see with um, K456, um, it's a, a robot that's really not visually marked at all by race and does not obviously address themes of racialization or diaspora. So a closer look, however, brings forward the politics of difference implicit in K456's design. So K456 might sound like um, President Ken Kennedy, but as a robot artist of aluminum, uh, wires, and wood, it does not re resemble President Kennedy in any realistic way. Grafted with foam breasts, K456 is anthropomorphic. However, it's almost five foot tall frame, aluminum frame, is not encased. And so, uh, in other words, K456 
says numerous colorful wires, white, green, orange, gray, and red, hang openly and nakedly like a collection of beautiful blue veins on a pale human leg. The nakedness of wires demonstrates a method of disordering similarly found in the ro robot opera um, brochure. K456's design transgresses um, the human and machine logics that hold in place the binary between Asian and American. And so in comparison with this early robot to his later robots, um, such as Family and Gertrude Stein made in the 1980s, which were very much enclosed, right? And you can see that um, they're um, made up of, um, you know, many small televisions, um, antique television sets and radios. Um, K456's open design of wires um, really subverts the supposed seamlessness of robots and it troubles the binary between human and machine. And so to return to the images of the robot opera performance, Mormont sits with the cello in a dress while Pax stands on her right. Situated in close proximity between the two is K456. So the strategic casting of the robot as a robot artist puts into question Pac's position and his labor as an artist. Pac holds the controller in his hands, underscoring the object as technological and how he has the means to control it. In this process of racial recalibration, he avoids replacing himself as an object and instead uses the robot to recalibrate conceptions of Asian Americans. Um, juxtaposing the racialized Asian as a robot with the humanized robot, robot opera sheds light on how race can be recalibrated through technology in order to disentangle the boundaries between human and machine, Asian and artist. While Pac dewired the robot way, by way of de-identifying and identifying the robot with the robot, and by utilizing the robot for a recalibration, in this final section, rewiring, I want to offer how the robot and artificial intelligence can be further utilized for creative and theoretical practice. And so like Pac and many um, folks at BCNM, I see emergent media as a way to resist. Um, and to this end, I will present briefly from my creative projects informed by emergent and experimental media and introduce my concept of the imitative real, which draws from artificial intelligence and um, the possibility of creative creativity and digital technologies. And more specifically, I examined this through the lens of drag performance and how the artificial is more like a space between camps and my formulation dismantles the essentialist power of the authentic. So when theorizing the digital, a return to computer scientist Alan Turing um, is in order as his questions of reality, fiction, and gender converge at the development of AI, which have made digital computers possible um, today. And so I um, definitely am informed by um, scholars such as Jacob Godberry, um, Jack Halberstam, and Andrew Hodges, who have written on Alan Turing. And so Alan Turing is best known for his work helping to break the German Enigma codes during World War II and his formative theorization of the contemporary digital computer, and specifically his um, influential and provocative 1950 essay, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, was published in the journal Mind, which posits AI and the universal machine. In his theory of AI, Turing outlines the template of the modern day computer with the imitation game. And a question, can machines think? Turing proposes that the game is played with three people, which includes a man and a woman and an interrogator who may be of either sex. For Turing, the object of the game is for the human interrogator to determine which is, who is a man and who is a woman. And later on, the objective changes in the article. As Turing, Turing posits, the human interrogator must figure out um, if the player is a computer or a human being. So if the binary choices right, of, um, of this test are undetermined by the human interrogator, then the computer is understood as intelligent. 
And so the Turing test does not identify if, if the computer is organic or can think, but it actually tests whether the human interrogator can determine whether one is a computer or not. So similarly, in the Turing test on gender, which um, comes earlier in the article, the question pivots on whether the human being um, can or cannot distinguish gender. And so while gender frames and introduces Turing's test, it is largely obscured um, in the history of computing and AI. Yet as Turing proposes the questions of gender, specifically who is a man or a woman, parallels questions of artificial intelligence. So if a human interrogator cannot determine woman or man, and similarly human or machine, then the machine can think. So the imitation game relies on the politics of performance and whether a human being um, can figure out authenticity. And like drag king performance, when we cannot determine the performer's gender of man or woman, um, uh, human or machine, the agency and transgression of non-normative gender and AI is affirmed. So moreover, Turing's personal life and desires prompt reconsideration of the history of digital computing as queer history. Turing was queer and at that time identified as homosexual. And while um, homosexuality at that time was a crime in the UK, he lived his life largely as an openly gay man. However, in 1952, two years after the publication of Computer Machinery and Intelligence, Turing was convicted of gross indecency by the Brit British government. The punishment for his crime forced Turing to undergo hormone treatment, believed to, quote, solve homosexuality. Turing's body during treatment, quote, was rendered impotent and began to um, grow breasts, as Halper Sam has written, Unfortunately, while the hormone treatments did not stop Turing's desire for men, it tragically reshaped Turing's life. In 1954, it is reported Turing committed suicide from eating an apple dipped in cyanide, and Turing's untimely death is thought to be the ramification of a deeply homophobic, um, you know, um, of the oppression that queer people faced during this time and the treatments that he endured. And it is not only until 2013 that he was pardoned for his sexuality. Yet as Halberstam and others have written, the apple and Turing, that Turing ate and his suicide, quote, bizarrely prefigures the Apple computer logo, unquote. Turing's untimely death is a sad and horrifying story of state-sanctioned homophobia, yet Turing's theorization of AI prompted Johnny von Neumann and other computer scientists in the 1950s to make possible our modern-day digital computer. As Turing's life offers, the history and theory of the digital cannot be divorced from questions of difference. So I've been very much informed from um, Alan Turing's writings on artificial intelligence. And um, as mentioned before, um, my work and interest in new media art um, is definitely shaped by a lot of this theory. And so I wanted to introduce um, um, a few projects. Um, and this is actually the Turing Test Tournament, which was um, launched here on campus at UC Berkeley in 2013. And it was the UC Berkeley chat-based version of Alan Turing's famous test. And it was a commission by the How I Read program where all freshmen um, read George Dyson's Turing's uh, Cathedral. And this was led by Professor Greg Niemeyer. Um, I don't know if folks still uh, participate in that particular program in freshman year. Um, but I thought it was a really um, generative way that freshmen could read the same book. And that year, it was really exciting that people um, were reading about Alan Turing and thinking about technology. And so as we translated this history into a game, we tried to um, uh, create a, a dynamic where players would try to figure out human from machine through chat-based competition and to meet other students. Um, and I was very... Um, you know, excited to work with faculty and students on this game and to serve as a conceptualist for the project. Um, and so here are some images. And this was a flyer, I think, in Moffitt. I'm not sure. Um, and so 
In、um, his article, Turing asks, "Can you write me a sonnet on the fourth bridge?" I could never write,、um, never write poetry. So in his work, he、um, Turing is always engaged not only with questions of gender but also the humanities and literature. And so my project,、um, the Kimchi Poetry Machine, investigates how to think about literature within the context of emergent media. And it's powered by open source tangible computing. And when the jar is open, you audibly hear poetry, and readers and listeners are immersed、uh, in feminist poetry. And I've invited eight poets to contribute poems to this particular machine. And then、um, there were Twitter poems inside the jar、uh, with the invitation to tweet a poem, and it was really a response to bookless libraries as well as Alan Turing's work.、Um, and this project was developed in the Invention Lab here, that's led by Chris Myers, Eric Paulson, and Bjorn Hartman.、Um, and I'm very pleased to be working on an installation part of this project,、um, asking questions about feminism and technology in the age of Me Too. Um, and as mentioned, I do write poetry on the page, and so、um, Alan Turing's question, "Can machines think?"、Um, somewhat got switched around, and I was very interested in affect and can, this question of can machines love. And so,、um, in these、um, collections of poetry, one is a chapbook, which is a smaller book of poetry, and the full-length collection. Um, explores this question through、um, science fictional narratives and poetry as code, um, and um, much of my digital practice includes a participatory media、um, engaging with. Um, those of communities who are marginalized and don't have access to technology, and so this work was incorporated in a large-scale project in the San Francisco jail, as mentioned, where I worked with the Department of Public Health and incarcerated women to develop their own digital stories、um, around HIV/AIDS、um, and incarceration, and it really、um, is. Part of my commitment to thinking about、um, the importance of、um, of the gender carceral na narrative and、um, how digital media and new media can intervene in this. And so,、um, and that's an awful picture of me, but I will show it. This is a picture of Helen Hall, who participated in the program. And this is upon release; she was able to speak at. The UCSF Center for AIDS, and so it really、um, was an opportunity for those part of the community that researchers were,、um, you know, studying to actually speak back and also teach、um, the researchers about their experiences. And so. To help theorize these questions of artificial intelligence, I return to my first documentary, All of Me, and I want to end this talk with a brief reading drawn from the fourth chapter of my book, and the politics of the imitative. When Alan Turing theorized artificial intelligence, the politics of gender. Has been largely obscured within the history of computing. However, thinking about gender can really help support our understanding of new media, as well as the importance of. How when media arts connects to theory and the interventions that can happen, and so my first documentary, my first short documentary, All of Me, was a very early project in 2007 that covered Asian American drag kings in the Bay Area, and this troupe starred Big Daddy Dang Kinky, Tito Ray Ray Pantsit on my face,、um, respectively performed by artists. Jai Arunvin, Vietnamese American artist Kat Dinh, and Filipino American artist Rachel Bora, and the Rice Kings are performers who quote consciously make a performance out of masculinity, as photographer Della Grace Volcano writes in the Drag King book. And so, in 2007, the Rice Kings were the first Asian American drag king troupe in the Bay Area. As drag kings subvert the idea of "quote unquote" normal gender, the theoretical work of Alan Turing on gender and dismantling of binary systems、um, sheds light on these intersections. And so, I want to end also with a gesture to feminist theorists such as、um, Tara McPherson, who really write on、um, the interventions right of creative practice as well as theory、um, and. Sort of dismantling the 
um, theory practice divide. So in LGBT historian Joan Scott's formative essay, The Evidence of Experience, notions of evidence, knowledge, and reality are problematized. Scott argues when excavating the historical stories of the other, who are oftentimes marginalized in US history, evidence and experience is offered, um, experience and testimony is offered as evidence. Yet she points out that this type of credibility may obscure the very practices and logics that create and sustain difference in the first place. In particular, Scott utilizes black gay science fiction writer Samuel Delaney's magnificent experimental memoir, The Motion of Light and Water, as an initial example. In the beginning of her essay, Scott argues that Delaney's recounting of his first visit to a gay bathhouse in 1960s New York demonstrates that, quote, knowledge is gained through vision. As Delaney, quote, remembers standing on the threshold of a gin-sized room dimly lit by blue bulbs, unquote. And he sees for the first time mass bodies, which give him a sense of political power. While Delaney provides a vital account of pre-Stonewall homosexual practices, Scott argues that this type of communication that privileges the seeing as evidence, while rightfully highlighting and making visible the experiences of those silence, silence can be problematic. Scott writes, the evidence of experience then becomes evidence for the fact of difference rather than a way of exploring how difference is established, unquote. So reconsidering the blue light central to Scott's reading of Delaney's text through the lens of emergent and new media and Asian American drag may help us understand the imitative real and the potentiality of technology. By tracing drag performance by way of the blue lights, we can reconsider how the real and the fake, the human and the human or machine logics in our digital age. So in new media art, I was taught when working with tangible computing, digital input and output are easier to circuit than analog input and output because computers use a binary system. It's interesting to think when designing a tangible user interface, if you use the words whether or not, either on or off, you need digital. And if you, you're using the words how much, stronger, faster, or brighter, you need at analog. Digital input can turn a light on or off. Analog can turn it brighter or dimmer. However, blue digital lights can also perform drag. For example, when circuiting a light to blink, to dim, not simply a binary of on or off, one could simulate analog within the computing processing program of Arduino to make the light blink continuously for the illusion of analog, multiple states of being. Thus, you would not know what analog or digital or the real or the fake is. The, the, the lights are actually luscious impersonations. So I want to end by returning to Scott's conclusion of the evidence of experience, which, where she actually revises her initial reading of Delaney. Scott initially analyzes Delaney's description of the bathhouse's dim blue lights as evidence of experience and that it could be um, problematic to unpacking the ways that marginalized communities are defined. Yet Scott returns to Delaney's memoir at her conclusion of her article to acknowledge her own misreading of the passage and the blue lights. Scott quotes literary critic Kristen Swan's point that the dim blue lights in Delaney's memoir suggest not evidence of the visible, but instead, quote, the properties of the medium through which the visible appear. Here, the dim blue light, whose disordering qualities pr produce a wavering of the visible, unquote. Sometimes this vision comes at the risk of faking it or failing miserably. Upon making my first Arduino light for a tangible computer, I mistakenly placed the LED in the wrong socket, almost short-circuiting it. Yet at my imitative reel, the digital actually radiated a brilliant dimming blue. I offer that we need the wavering blue light, 
like the Rice Kings, like Alan Turing, and like Namjoon Park, to envision beyond the visible, into imagining a history and the, and the future of the machine and the robot that draws from theory and practice and that offers existing alternatives to hegemonic systems. Emergent and experimental media hybridize the human and machine analytic, and it transforms the binaries between art and technology, human and machine, and Asian American through deconstruction, experimentation, and imagination. Thank you. Um, do we? Take questions at this point? Or, okay, all right. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, sure, in the back. Hello. Okay, um, thank you again for your talk. Um, it occurred to me that the way that you were theorizing technology and race was actually um, I was thinking about it in terms of braiding the discourses of techno Orientalism together with the discourse of Afrofuturism, uh, uh, Afro right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, insofar as in the first discourse, discourse of um, techno-orientalism, to be a machine is to be inhuman, mm -hmm. whereas in, in terms of Afrofuturism, to, um, to project into space, to become um, a machine or a robot is a way of, is a means of reclamation, mm -hmm. right? Or a, a means towards um, imagining utopia. Um, but it also seems to me that these two discourses, you know, they arose out of very divergent um, histories and theories. So I would just ask, I, I would like to, yeah, I mean, is there a way in which you are thinking about the, um, about, um, you know, Afro, um, Afro-American thought in your project as well? Like, how would you think those two together? What are the discrepancies in thinking them together? Sure. Um, thank you so much for your question. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, thank you, techno-Orientalism um, and Afrofuturisms are really um, important movements, uh, theoretically as well as politically, um, and techno-Orientalism, you know, the work by Betsy Huang and Greta New certainly have shaped and informed, um, you know, my thinking around technology and Asian Americans. Um, and as well as thinking about Afrofuturism um, in terms of em embracement, right, of technology. And folks like Douglas Kearney with the Black Automaton and others do really important work around this intersection. Um, I mean, for me, I think um, I'm also interested in, in, right, as you point out, sort of the in-betweenness between those two discourses. Um, and the early part of my um, book project, in, and what happens is, is really kind of the comparative way that black people and Asian Americans are racialized. Um, this idea that, um, you know, blackness is always tied to this, this idea of the animal, right? There, and as well as indigenous people, and therefore, um, able to be subjected to slavery as well as other kinds of racism. And so the way of becoming technological becomes very important, I think, especially um, if we think about recent films like Black Panther or Janelle Monae's work around the android to think about slavery, that they really kind of deconstruct this really um, very tied way that animal and blackness have been made um, and really re rethink the machine. Um, and in the same way, um, Asian Americans have been so tied negatively, you know, um, to the machine. However, as we can see, many artists have used technology and the robot in really interesting and creative ways. Um, it becomes much more important for I think Asian American theorists who are thinking about questions of power to um, distance oneself, right, from um, techno-orientalism, right? We don't wanna be seen as machines. We don't wanna be seen as emotionless. And so something like Afrofuturism or Asian futurism becomes a bit more challenging because uh, when one is always, you're subjected, right, to that characterization. And so I do kind of point to very early on 
the racial formations that were um, made between the two groups. And, and we can also think of many, you know, that racism and racial formation isn't created um, singularly or in a void, that it was always really comparative and sort of against one another. And, um, Asia, and blackness and Asian Americans have definitely certainly been tied in these particular ways. Um, I mean, we can also see really um, exciting movements right now, like um, the Smithsonian, the Asian Pacific American Center, did a really cool um, event on um, technology and Asian Americans that really, um, you know, was informed by Afrofuturism. And, and so it was a more um, kind of, uh, you know, um, curated program of solidarity in which these questions around technology and people of color were um, explored. Oh, sure, yes. Um. Just a remark in relationship to in relation to your question to it's interesting that this talk about technology and gender is occurring today on the day of the passing of Katherine Johnson. Uh, one of the headlines that I saw described her as a human computer, um, but computer was also a job title that was that existed at, within NASA um, where women of more uh, usually women were doing basic calculations for um, rocket launches. Great, thank you for your comment. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's very important to think about technology and these terms such as computer or even typewriter and how they've been tied to gender and um, human labor, right? So. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. So your comment about how African Americans, indigenous Americans, and Asian Americans were all um, racialized with respect to one another as well as animalized uh, got me thinking. Mm -hmm. Are there any comparable images of, of, of robotic African Americans, for example, that would be comparable to the ones of the many armed Chinese guy you showed. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the reason I'm wondering is, um, from what I understand, the word robot um, um, connotes forced labor. Mm -hmm. And there's always sort of this labor, unfree labor um, uh, connotation to it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one thing I'm wondering about. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you for your question. So, um, I mean, there, there's certainly, I think the largely the images of African Americans during the antebellum um, period and a reconstruction, and we can, you know, point to Henry Louis Gates's recent book, Stony the Road, um, and Theaster Gates's work and sort of his exhibition that they really did characterize um, African American and uh, Americans and their bodies as very exaggerated and very closely tied to this idea of the ape or the gorilla. Um, and those images really um, were very common in the editorial cartoons that I studied. Um, however, it also doesn't mean that um, that sort of the line between um, you know, African American to an animality and Asian Americans to robots were so tied because there were also images of Chinese workers as um, rat eaters, right? That was a really common trope um, and very much kind of characterized in those ways. And so, um, but yeah, I think the popular culture, and we can also see kind of minstrel um, performances, just how, um, how much there there really was kind of an embodiment and so a lot of that um, is due to the way that African Americans upon reconstruction were not allowed um, largely to work in these factories that were highly were industrializing and so they were seen and characterized as unfit 
labor. And Ronald Takaki and Tomas Almaguer write about this. And um, and so in doing so, I think what happens is the discourse begins to shift in, in terms of justifying that. Um, there was an early African-American automaton, very similar to the automaton Turk named Joyce Hearth, that was um, being kind of showcased around at the same time. But her trope was it was very much not like a automaton, but more as um, sort of um, like a slave, a quote unquote slave uh, woman robot from the past. And so there was these very um, interesting, but also certain like very denigrating ways that history and the past were always intertwined in those characterizations. Okay, yeah, I think that's the last question. So. Oh, sorry, just time for one more if anyone has one. Okay, sure. Hi, thank you for speaking tonight. Um, so as I understand it, kind of the second movement is about like racial recalibration and how racial recalibration is kind of like an assertion of humanity on behalf of you know the Asian American who's racialized as robotic. Um, but also kind of like the third movement where it's um, focused on the imitative real is also kind of like an assertion of humanity. I'm wondering if you can kind of speak to the difference between racial recalibration and the imitative real, mm -hmm. if they're both kind of gesturing towards this like assertion of humanity, um, if I'm understanding it right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for your comments and your question. Um, yeah, you know, in some ways, I think um, this idea of racial recalibration really came from thinking about um, objects and human um, positionings and, and the visual. And so even thinking of, you know, actor theory network and sort of um, thinking through how that becomes a way that Asian American artists can resist. And as you point out, the, the other term in terms of the imitative real becomes a bit more nebulous in some ways and is really tied to thinking about the digital and um, also very much informed by queer theory and how um, in queer theory, the, the um, intervention, right, of not having the binary between, um, you know, male or female or homosexual and heterosexual. And so um, queerness then can, you know, in ways I think also definitely be t tied to thinking about um, the digital and the possibilities of, um, of computing. And so I think for me, um, racial recalibration is a bit more tied specifically to Asian American artists who are, I think, conscious of their own subjugation and racialization in terms of technology and the robot. And the latter is a bit more um, sort of also a way to demonstrate the importance of a creative critical practice and what we can also see the blue light, not only as something in all of our screens and something that keeps us up at night, but something that we can imagine as, um, as a, like a mode of possibility. All right, great. Okay, great. I think that's it. Thank you.